All right, last piece, another 15 slides also. So uh, last uh, set of topic that I want to talk about is uh, the evaluation for the SNAPR call qualities. So, so basically by the end of uh, the previous part, we talk about, uh, we got uh, the original sequence, which is FASTQ file, we did a sequence alignment, and then we did a variant call recalibration, and then we did a, not, not a, the base call recalibration, and we did a refined alignment, and then to the variant call and the variant call recalibration. Right? Remember, there's many steps, right? And then each one associated with the sum of the mathematical formulas. At this step, hopefully, we have a good chance to identify some good variants. And now let's see how do we really evaluate what we already got. So the first thing is uh, very simple, actually. Just to give your best estimation. So if uh, I'm doing whole genome sequencing, for example, and I, if uh, I identify 3 million SNPs, yeah, that's about right. If I identify 10 million SNPs for one individual, I'm not sure you sequence the human. So, so those are the things that you want to chip that in. Those I mean, just an estimation on that. And uh, so those are basically very gross estimations. So you can see that uh, if this is uh, for, I mean, basically that's the equation of how you generate, you can estimate the number of polymorphism sites being identified. So if it's a European and whole genome sequencing, you are estimating you are going to get 3.3 million uh, SNPs. And it's, if it's Africa, African genome, the whole genome is about 4.3 million SNPs it, it, because of the diversity. And then if it's a 32 uh, megabase of exome region for Europeans, you can get about 20,000 SNPs, but uh, for African, you get uh, 23,000 SNPs. Now we are more focused on, in terms of whole exome, is that the general standard is about 55 million base. So usually we got 30 to 35,000 variants. And sometimes you go to extended regions, like 76 million base regions, that will also cover the promoter and the 3 UTR regions. So now you, you are looking at a little bit more SNPs. But in general, you want to have a general estimation whether your number of SNPs being identified is in the right both part, okay? And, uh, and when we write a paper or when I write grants, I have to tell NIH that uh, I have enough rigor uh, to really do rigor, rigor to do this. And so, so basically, we, we, there are many different steps that we can go through. The first one is we want to look at the concordance with the genotype chip calls. So because the reason for this is for many of the disease samples, collecting samples are not easy, and, and many people already have it. So, so the chance is they have the blood of these in the, this patients. They have done whole uh, like a g g uh, genotyping array in the past, and then now we are having the sequencing technology. They got the blood to do it, do it again. So for those samples, that we want to see whether the two technologies, the signal, agree with each other. Usually, we want to see about 99 percent of the concordance between these two technologies. Otherwise, one thing will be wrong. And if that happens, we need to figure out whether it's the sequencing part or it is the, the genotyping part. And another group of information I usually want to look at is what fraction of SNPs are already known, okay? So when we identify 40,000 SNPs from whole exome sequencing, usually I want to see what's the percentage of variants being seen before. And that number is normally more than 90%. So if uh, I'm seeing only 20% of uh, the variants have the SNP membership, DB SNP membership, I will be concerned. It is either we haven't, uh, we identified too many false positives 
or maybe there are some of the steps in the middle that we made a mistake, like we use the wrong reference genome or some of these algorithms because there are so many algorithms. I mean, during the steps, the parameter setting wasn't wrong. So we need to take a look at that. And uh, so we usually it will be larger than 90%. And we also need to adjust the expectation when considering costs across the samples. And then remember, last time we talked about TITV ratios. And this is the time that I'm going to use that information. If I did a whole exome sequencing, I want to calculate the TITV ratio. Remember, if I run them, TITV ratio should be 0 0.5, okay? So TI will be the transition from the, 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 the changes between purines or between permeatins. And, uh, um, and the and transversion will be across, so from, from, from a pu between a purine and the permeating changes. So if by random, this TITV ratio should be 0 0.5, but because of the evolution reasons that we often see that uh, in exon regions, this TITV ratio is 2.8, and for the whole genome, it's 2.1. And, uh, and so, so you can see that this is another way to evaluate our results. So these are just uh, some of rules and to do this. And you just, uh, I mean, I, I mean that's, that's one thing that I will first look at my data sets. If I, if I see this number is, uh, way wrong, I normally want to go back to see what happened uh, during the steps. Okay, so the last part uh, of this lecture is going to look at into more on the structure variations. And I have to say that every slice that being uh, put in here was, was prepared by Dr. Hong Yu Gao from the Center for Medical Genomics. And, uh, and basically, she taught me how to say these things this morning, okay? Uh, <laughs> actually, yeah, she went through all these slides with me. Um, so there is a different type of large structure. When we talk about structure variations, we are not talking about SNPs. We are not talking about a small insertion deletions. These are large structure variations like this, the deletion, so you can see top is a reference genome, and this is the donor, which is the sample we sequenced. And very clearly, this part is a deletion that is supposed to be in the reference, but not in our genome. And for this particular case, we are usually talking about a few hundred to sometimes a few hundred thousand base. And we have seen those are large structure variations. In many extreme cases, it could be the entire chromosome, a big chunk of chromosome, and that will generate a, a much bigger problem, okay? For example, Down syndrome, we're taught, we, we know that there will be uh, the three copies of chromosome 21, and that there are other diseases are like that, a very big chunk of chromosome diseases. Uh, but this is deletion. And, uh, but this is uh, the novel sequencing insertion. So you can see that uh, in our reference, uh, there is no, but then somehow in this particular individual, there is a, a big chunk of sequence being pushed in. And uh, there is a other like a mobile element insertion. Usually for this case, these uh, mobile elements, they are more like the, retro uh, the retrovirus those type of things. So there are some virus that is hanging around in our genome. Some of them are still active, believe it or not. So they can come out and then insert it into some part of the genome. Most of them are dead, meaning they are in our genome, they are being immobilized, and, but there are some of them are still jumping. So, so sometimes we will see, see those type of things. Um, and. Uh, and then there's a tandem duplication. So, so you can see that this one part would become two copies into it. And uh, this is the interspersed duplications. In this case, you are expecting this part is inserted here and somewhere else is not connecting to each other. So this is, could be the situation of copy number variation as well. And uh, there is an inversion. So if you look at this figure, is uh, this part is fine. But the middle part of the, this genome 
is kind of somehow inverted in this particular individual. Uh, and this uh, may or may not generate a phenotype. And uh, sometimes it would, and uh, but sometimes it, it, it's just sitting there. We never know it. Okay. And honestly, if we don't look at our data carefully enough, we wouldn't even we even wouldn't know it. Okay. Once even you, you sequence this individual, you probably won't identify it. Right. I mean, because we are sequencing short rates, and uh, and all these regions. Uh, Regardless of what their orientations are, they will be identified. We'll see the mapping on that. So, so just keep in mind of those. And the translocations in the reference genome is here, and in the in the alternative, it, it could be in the different locations. So you can see that uh, something like this will happen. So, but the the, the general idea of this is uh, these are large structure variations, and the most of the algorithms we were talking about are not being designed to identify this. So this is, again, a still very active uh, uh, research area to develop algorithms to identify this. So we often see nature method paper coming out on this type of stuff in, even in recent years, okay? Um, so this is a very small, and so I don't want to go through this, and you wouldn't have a chance to, to see it towards the back. But the, the bottom line I want to go through is, uh, when we study the structure variations using NGS data, there are usually four type of, four type of information source we're using, okay? <coughs> that will be read pairs. Because when we sequence the genomic DNA sequence, we normally do paired end rates. Okay, we got a 300 to 500 DNA fragments we sequence from both two ends. Those will give us a lot of information. So those are the information that we use. So the second one is the read the depths. Okay, so you can see briefly from here is if you have a deletion in this region, you don't see a lot of rays. So that read depths, and in this case, they will see much more rays. So this is something that will give you that type of information to see whether some type of structure information is happening. And the third part is the split rays. So what that's supposed to mean is we got a sequencing rate, we sequence from both two ends. Okay, and we'll go through some examples of those are read pairs. But for one arm of it, if we're de dealing with 100 base, two by 100, right, each end is 100 base. Within this 100 base, some part is going to be break out if there's an insertion or deletion. And based on that information, and these are called the split rates, and we are going to study the structure variations. And the third, the last part, and the first three, they are all sequence alignment based on analysis. You first need, you need to read, align your rates back to the reference genome. But there is assembly based analysis as well. So you don't do reference uh, alignment before you identify structure variations. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at a few additional information. So the first one is uh, the structure variation discovery using read pairs. Um, so, so you can read all these, these are very, very good information. But I, I would just uh, go through these figures briefly. And the, the first one, the structure variation class is a deletion. And then, so you can see that uh, this is uh, the real thing. This is your, the, the donor sample you want to sequence, okay? Let's see, you know there is a 500 basis of your insertion size. Your DNA is 500 basis. You know it, okay? This is something you can control, right? So when you do the DNA sequence, before you do that, you do the, you do the DNA fragmentation, you break it into certain sizes. So you know, let's say this is a 500 base. But when you align these two ends back to the genome, you found the distance between these two are 5,000 bases. What happened is uh, actually in the DNA it's only 500, but if you map to the reference genome, it becomes 5,000. That means in the middle, there's a big chunk is being deleted from the DNA 
the donor DNA you want to sequence. Okay, so the general idea is uh, just uh, by looking at the distance of uh, the pairs, you will have a general idea whether there is a deletion or not. Okay, so now if we look at the insertions, uh, this will be a little bit risky, but this cannot be identified a very large one. Let's say your this is a 100 base rate, 100 base rate, the whole thing is 500. And then you have a 300 made in the middle that is the insertion, for example. And then when you align to, to the DNA, you find that these two kind of only 20 base pair apart. That means you are having an insertion in the middle of this, okay? And that this is uh, the inversion part. So looking at in the middle and the, uh, so middle part is kind of a turn the di direction. So that is the inversion part. So you are seeing that uh, in your DNA is supposed to be this one and this one paired together. But somehow what you observed is this end is mapped to here and this end is supposed to be here, but somehow it mapped to pretty far away and then turn into the wrong direction. So you're supposed to see something mapped to the DNA is like this, right? Now you're seeing something like this. And, and then you have seen this one supposed to be this, and now it become this. So if you, you, you see a lot of these rays coming along at one area, that means uh, there is an inversion, right? So, so that is, uh, so just based on how these rays are, are being aligned back, whether their behavior is, uh, is uh, uh, consistent with what you are trying to, to, to identify or your read lens, uh, the, the DNA fragment size, and that gives you a lot of information. The general idea is uh, this is based on the pair of rays to do that, okay? And then the second, uh, so, so this is an a, a algorithm that is published in uh, Ken Chen's lab, uh, and down in Houston, so basically this is a tool called the breakdown search, and I'm not going to go through in very detail, but this is a, a very well-respected tool that a lot of people are using. And then basically they start from here and, uh, and the data mapping, and then they look at this, uh, they call it anonymous read pairs, actually it's, it's just a concordance one, this concordance one, so, so something is wrong type of race, right? Either too far away or too close or turn the directions. So identify those type of regions and then search for those regions and identify the interconnected clusters somehow and identify, eventually look at the structure variation and com com compute the confidence intervals. So these two can be used to identify deletions, insertions, inversions, translocations and interchromosome and X uh, intrachromosomes. So it's a very, very cool stuff. But the general idea still coming back is uh, based on how the rays the distribution behaves and, uh, and things like that. So the second uh, type of information that I mentioned is to use the split rays. So you can see here, I'm, I'm sorry, this is a little small, but we can look at it in terms of the deletion case. And uh, this is very clear here is, uh, uh, so you can see that this is a pair of rays, right? And then somehow there is a deletion happened here. This is your reference genome, this is your sample genome, and this green part is the kind of gone, okay? And then when you do this, uh, you, in your sample genome, you are sequenced this much. Each one is 500 bases apart, right? And then when you map it back to the reference genome, and then you find that they are very far away from each other. And so this is the, the, the read pair scenario that we talk about. But for this pair, the purple pair, so you see one end is here, which is perfect but the other pair is being split, okay? And if you have your algorithm written in the right way, you can exactly identify this part is being mapped here, this part is being mapped here, okay? It's more difficult to do, but if you did that correctly, 
you not only confirm that there's, there's a deletion, actually you also identify the junction point. You identify exactly where the deletion happened. For this case, if you use this blue rays, you wouldn't know where the deletion happened. You just know the deletion happened in the middle. But this one, using this uh, split rate, you can also identify where it happened. Does that make sense? Okay. And the next one is to read the, look at the read depths. So you can see here in the deletion part, again, this one, I don't care about where it maps, whether their orientation is right or they have a break in the middle. Now I'm just going through the signals intensity. So you can see if it's a deletion, and then you are seeing this part is going to be sequenced a lot less because it, you don't have DNA or you have only one or you have the DNA in that region. And if this is the interspersed the duplication or this tandem duplication, but regardless of what that is, you are going to see in this region there are many more reads. Okay, so remember what is interspersed and what is tandem? Let me remind you. Is a, so this is a, the interspersed first, meaning that one is inserted in multiple places, but they are kind of pretty far away. But this one is like they are kind of connecting with each other and again and again. So, but regardless of what these two types are, and then you are going to see the same pattern about the, the, the by looking at the read depths. Okay. So, so that is uh, the, so basically you use the read pairs, you use the split, split rate, you use the depths, and you can identify structure variation. So this is uh, another uh, way of doing this, and this is another method just published very recently. This is also from Ken Chen's lab, just uh, um, very recently, to look into using the local assembly information. Okay, there are two things. First one, this is assembly. The second one, this is not a assemble everything. It's a local assembly. So, so let's see what they really try to do, okay? So you got your, your sequences from whole genome. In this case, they were trying to identify cancer mutations, cancer structure variations, the somatic ones. So meaning they, identified, they did the sequencing on both the tumor samples as well as the blood. So you want to, they want to see what structure variation is being generated that is different from with the, the, the uh, germline mutations. So those are structure variation things. So what they did at just a very, very high level is they will first break all those reads actually into K-MERS, okay? So you can see that those are all being break into K-MERS. And uh, they break their reads from the tumor they also broke their rays from the normal samples or germlines. And actually, they also break the reference genome into KMERS as well, okay? So there are a couple of things they did. The first one is from their, their samples and the, the tumor samples, they remove all the gray ones. Those gray ones are the KMERS that they derived from the reference genome, okay? And the second one is, uh, they further remove the blue ones. The blue ones are the KMERS. They identified from the normal genome. Normal genome meaning the germlines. And then they only have the, the red lab. And then for this red, they are able to trace back which KMERS is coming from, which read, and grab those reads to do the assembly. So in this case, they are doing assembly. We know the, how painful it is to do assembly, right? And they can have a lot of different arbitrary interpretation. But now because of the way that they are handling the data, and actually most of the, 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 the noise is being removed. So they only focus on very localized region to do the assembly. That will be much, much easier. So that is, and eventually they identify those structure variations and then they report that in, into the VCF files. And uh, so I have to say that there is also a trend that uh, there are several tools available 
to combine all the information, not only use the split rate, not only use the, the, the read pairs, not only use the depths, but using all of them to, I mean, have an educated uh, guess on whether you identify the structure variation or not, okay? So, so that is, uh, again, I'm not uh, talking about any specific algorithm uh, in any detail, but I just want to tell you what are the information being used by different algorithms in different ways to identify the structure variations, okay? So the last part is uh, using this uh, short rays of sequencing like we did for Illumina, uh, and uh, to do the identify structure variation is clearly not the best way, okay? And uh, it's a, there are a lot of uh, kind of prediction going on and we have to do this way and that way. So there are a lot of things we cannot find. So those are the lists of uh, why it's not good. So I think this is a good exam point as well. Um, so, but we talk about using the long rays to sequence. So we talk about the pack bell, and, uh, and the, the, the nanopore sequencing. And last time, remember, we also talked about the, the, uh, the 10x genomics, so the molecular barcode on a much extended region, and then to do the local assembly. So those are also a possibility, okay? Um, and the uh, next lecture, we will have a guest lecture, and uh, Dr. Matteo Vata, and uh, he is a, uh, uh, an adjunct fa faculty in our department. He is now actually working in a, a clinical diagnosis company and uh, uh, actually is in California, but uh, he lives in Indianapolis. So he will, he will agree to come here to give a, a lecture talking about uh, the, what we need to pay attention to in using this technology in the clinical setting. It's very different uh, from uh, doing research. And then I'm going to distribute part two. I'm going to uh, continue working on two topics. The first one is uh, once we identify the variants, that's what we're trying to get through today, right? Once we identify the variants, how we interpret the variants? What are, I mean, how do we make a story out of it? And, uh, and then I also want to briefly review the statistical method that we do in addition, not on the whole, um, the GWAS study, but on the rare variants being identified, okay? So that will be next lecture, okay? So if you guys don't want to take the quiz, uh, we will we'll end today now, all right?